Okay, so I'm going to start. Hi there, my name is Sebastian, and today I'm going to talk to you about Vagrant, the tool that makes my life and the life of many developers way, way easier. And it's such a great tool that I decided to tell all of you about it. So you can use it, you can go out there and tell other people, just connecting open minds. You are here maybe because of one of two reasons. The first reason may be that you started with a fairly easy LAMP stack, so you got a PHP running, you got your um, uh, Apache or an Nginx, you got your MySQL and everything lined up, and then things got complicated. And you add your tools, you add your peer stuff, um, you need, I don't know, image magic for something, and it gets complicated and more complicated, and Sooner or later, you don't know what your stack really is. You have a hard time figuring out to set up a new device. So you get a new laptop, you don't know what you need to install for all those projects, and things really tend to mess up. Second reason may be this one. You actually, it works on your PC, but not on the production server or on the staging server or wherever, mostly because you are running, for example, a Windows, and your production is Linux, and then everything really is different. Not everything, but much stuff is different. And this really isn't nice to debug. Vagrant can help you with that. The third reason maybe you're just curious. You heard about Vagrant. What is this really? I don't know. And that's why you're here, and that's where I can help you. And I can also help you with the other two problems you might have. Before starting, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Sebastian. I'm doing project management these days and also software development in my free time. I'm originally from Munich, Germany, now living in Vienna. And yeah, besides uh, music and body modification and all the other stuff, I'm also into Agile and DevOps, which is really why I love Reagan so much, because Reagan really is this merging between development and systems engineering and systems uh, administration. I am working for Vogelzwasserty, a Vienna-based startup which does location-based uh, bargain hunting. So you have all these, these special offers from all these companies, uh, uh, supermarkets, but also sports companies, and you want to know about all these, and that's what we are there for. We uh, see where you are and then show you what really is there for you to get. And before that, I co-founded PicturePlix, a Munich-based startup. We did uh, a design service for photo books. So the idea was you're coming back from holiday and you uh, have your 200 photos, load them up, a designer is putting them in place and you're getting back a really nice photo book. And before that, I studied information systems and management in Munich. Okay. What are we going to do? I will talk to you about what Vagrant really is. I will tell you where it can help you and where it maybe can't help you. I'll um, also show you how to get started. And then I will talk a little bit about the pros and cons, what is there for you to know so you don't go in the same or you don't uh, actually experience the same pitfalls I did and you're a little bit smarter. Before that, I would um, like to talk a little bit about how it is these days. So um, normally, mostly, you set up everything on your local host. So you have your Linux, you have your Windows, and then you install maybe XAMPP, maybe Apache and PHP and everything, and then you get it running. And then your colleague comes over and you want, he wants also to start, and then he sets everything up, and then you have to see that the configuration is the same, that the versions are the same, and then you change your configuration, it needs to go to your colleague, and if you're a big company and you have, I don't know, 10, 20 developers or 50 developers or something, it's really hard to merge all these. Or maybe you're a little bit more advanced and you decide to set up a virtual machine with your IDE, with your, um, with your source code and everything, and also with your stack, and this would mean that you don't have the problem of merging it, you can easily give it to your colleague, but then he has to, um, to change things, he maybe wants a different IDE or some different settings, 
he may do something different. He, of course, needs to change some basic stuff, like, I don't know, the git config or everything. And then one week later, you decide to add a new program, and then you give the virtual machine back to him, and he says, oh, no, <laughs> I just changed everything. And you won't, will do this once, you maybe do it twice, but then you start, stop doing it because it's so much work. And if you are a really big company or if you are really into, into um, setting up those things, you could set up a remote virtual machine where your code gets synced in and then you could use some kind of virtualization method where you could um, set up the same virtual machine for all of your developers or actually one for each, and then everyone has his source code in there, and it gets synced, and everybody can look at it, and also the setup is the same. Problem here is that this is very costly, because you need a server for every developer, or at least a virtual server, but they need to be on bare metal somewhere. And you, of course, need to set it up. You need to maintain it. If the server goes down, 10 developers sitting around because they cannot develop, and that's not very nice. On the other hand, the developer is fairly, is fairly, um, uh, is not tied to the environment, so he can switch laptops, and as soon as the code gets synced into the virtual machine, everything works. And this is what, what big companies do many times, sometimes not, and it works really well if you are a big company, but probably if you are two to three people, if you're just starting out, or if you are alone and just want to have something, this is not the best option. The last thing you could do is you could go into the cloud and use something like Cloud9 or Code Anywhere or Coding, which is really a whole environment, a whole dev environment in the cloud. So you have your IDE in the browser, you have the whole VM set up for you, and all you do is really using your browser. You can do it on the iPad if you want, and then uh, code in the train on the way home on the iPad, or even on your phone, if the, at least if the browser uh, works on the phone, if the website is responsive and everything, or if they have an app, then you could develop there. Problem here is that this is a little bit of a vendor login, because of course they don't really give you much of options what you can install. You have the, the normal setup, but if they run PHP 5.3, then they run PHP 5.3, and you have not that many options to get everything, anything updated. You're also depending on an internet connection, so if internet dies, you cannot work if you are on the train and bad internet connection, then this is really, really hard to do. It also means that you pay recurring fees for your IDE and for your environment, which may not be the best thing. And Vagrant can help with that. Vagrant was developed four years ago by uh, one guy, Mitchell, and he decided to to tie together, actually what he, what he did was not, not making anything really new in terms of software. He just plugged everything together, make it nice to use, and this really worked out. He now has a small company who is doing the, the Vagrant development and maintaining the open source project and also does some viable uh, updates, plugins, so you could if you don't want to write the plugins yourself, you could either hire him or he has some, some plugins on sale. Vagrant is open source and will ever be, according to him, open source. So this is really like adding some company on top of Vagrant to maintain it and also make some money out of it, but not in, uh, it doesn't um, interfere with the open source project. So you can, without paying any money, you can use Vagrant full up to, up to speed. Uh, the only things are there may be some plugins which he developed which are not open source, which you have to buy. And what Vagrant really is, Vagrant really is about virtualiz virtualization and about virtual machines running on your PC, which are then, um, which, you, which you run your development stack on but your IDE and your source code stays on your host. So the idea is to have Apache, PHP, MySQL, whatever, in a VM, and then sync your code in there and develop on your host. This means that you, for example, can give the VM to somebody else, and all he needs to do is 
tweak a little bit how the code gets in there, but actually you can reuse the machine because there is nothing really depending on you in this, in this virtual machine. Um, and because Vagrant uses so many, or is tied to so many things, I would like to do a short introduction on on the on the verbs or the, the names I will use. So the configuration is really the Vagrant file. So you have one file where everything tied to the VM is set up. You have the boxes, which are actually just exports from either VirtualBox or VMware. So it's a really virtual machine like you know it, like you can run it from VirtualBox right now. It's really exported and then put into a tar file. So nothing new there. The providers are the actual virtual virtual machine, um, VirtualBox or VMware or whatever you're using. EC2 is one provider. It's really exchangeable. You have the configuration there. Sorry, you have sync folders, which are actually the shared folders. It's just a, a common name, so you, it's named sync folders. You have the configuration. Um, the Sorry, I'm lost. The uh, provisioners, sorry, which are doing all the configuration for you, which are um, better known in the in the system administration uh, group of people. Developers don't know that much about it because it's not really touching their their field really. Um, but these are actually um, tools where you describe in some kind of meta language how your server looks like, and then it's reproducible. So you just execute the the tool. Uh, just execute something and then it all gets installed on your PC. So you say, I need Apache in this version, I need a config file there, and I need this template there, and then it just puts all into place. What else do we have? We have plugins. Plugins are, as we know it, some extension. They can be plugins, can be providers, they can be provisioners, they can be some comments which you can execute on top of the normal Vagrant stuff, and they can also be something in between. So you could have a plugin which says, I don't know, every five minutes uh, SSH into my into my box and do something crazy which I need or don't need, which is just fun, whatever you like. The main thing, or the the really the the, the point is um, the where everything revolves around is the Vagrant file. So this is the one file you need. You install um, Vagrant. You install, for example, VirtualBox, and then you need a Vagrant file. And this is all, all you need to run your virtual environment. And this Vagrant file is Ruby code, but it's fairly easy to read as far as I'm concerned. I guess you can all, at least the fir first two lines, you can all make out what this, what this really means. So um, you configure everything in there. First, there is the Two things I set up everywhere. This is the IP and the host name. The IP is mainly because I have many virtual machines and I give each a different IP so they don't interfere with each other. Vagrant can figure out this by itself, but it means that the, your IPs are all over the place. And if you, for example, have a host file and you want to tie special, special domains to your host, then it's good to not have a random, random IP, but a really uh, fixed IP and the host name. Of course. Then we have the boxes, and as I said before, boxes are just exports from VirtualBox uh, into a tar file, and you don't need to do them uh, yourself. There are many open source boxes which are set up for Vagrant because you need a little bit of tweaking. When you have a VirtualBox right now, you cannot just take them and put them into Vagrant. I mean, you could, but it will not really work because Vagrant, for example, needs a Vagrant user in the virtual box, so you can SSH into it, and it needs some, some minor configurations inside the virtual machine to really know where it's running. And so you cannot take every box, but there are many, many open source boxes. And the box I have mentioned here in the box URL is actually pretty much the standard box you can use these days. It's provided by the Vagrant app. It's kind of the reference box. It's Ubuntu 12.10. It works fairly well. And this configuration here means that if there is a box precise 64 on my Vagrant installed, you can install it by common line or through this URL, then it uses this one. If it doesn't find the box, it downloads it automatically from there. So you don't even need to install a box or put it somewhere. If it's somewhere on the web where it's accessible, Vagrant can figure it out all by himself. 
if you configure it like this. So you don't even need to take care as a developer. If somebody sets up for you, you don't even need to take care of the virtual boxes. Next up are the providers. I mentioned VirtualBox a lot because it's the reference. It, uh, Vir um, Vagrant started with VirtualBox as the sole provider, and then it moved the providers out of the core and make it extensible. So you now have, for example, VirtualBox as a standard and VMware as the more sufficient or more, actually more advanced provider. You can uh, buy the plugin for VMware from HashiCorp, the company behind Vagrant, or you can write it on your own if you want. You even have an EC2, so you can actually, from your command line, boot up EC2 instances, provision them, SSH into them. You have a little bit of a problem when you want to sync the code because it's over the web and you need to figure out how to do this. But everything else works pretty well, and you can write your own provider. It's fairly easy. It's Ruby, but it's not that hard, and if you really need some other virtualization, if you need something, you can just, just do that. As I said, it's fairly extensible. You also have your sync folders, and sync folders are just a common name for what VirtualBox calls share folders, what in EC2 might be an uh, NFS linked, but it's just getting your, your source code, which is on your host, into the virtual machine somewhere. And you can really tie the, your um, host folders to your VirtualBox folders anywhere. So you can say, for example, as I have here, I have some project folder on my, on my host, and I put this into var vv project on the guest. And then I can do anything in my virtual machine. I can point Apache to it and actually use the, the real code. And as soon as I change anything, of course, as this is uh, usual with shared folders, they are also in the virtual machine. This means, of course, that your PHP Storm or Eclipse or Vim or whatever uh, only needs to be installed on your host and you're working like you would if it, everything is installed virtually, just that your development stack is inside the virtual machine. A little bit of a problem with these shared folders is that VirtualBox is not really good at them. So if you are on Windows, you will experience really slow down after 7,000 files. But I will talk about this later, what this really means. And how you can work around this. So provisioners, I said or I introduced them before, a little bit sloppy, as I may say. Provi provisioning is really about getting your virtual machine or actually any machine from the point of installation to the point of usage. So you have this point where this is where you just have installed your machine and everything is pretty standard. And then you want to get to a point where you can really use it where everything is installed. And you could do this by hand, of course, but this tends to mess up things because you need to write it down. And if you ever set up a a Linux for production, you know that this is not an easy task and you have many configuration files you change, many symlinks you create, very, very much stuff and sometimes it depends on the, on the OS you are running. So it's not, not really, really a f fun task to do. I mean, once it's fun, but the next time it's not. So you can have provisioners in Vagrant, and these are not Vagrant-specific provisioners, but tools which are used all over the, the, the DevOps community mainly, and also system administrators are really eager to using them, and Vagrant just plugs them in. So you're not doing something special for Vagrant. You can actually use, if you have some configuration management tool inside your company, you can reuse that. You just need to write a plugin, or you use the existing ones, and then you're good to go. One provisioner is the shell provisioning, which is just running shell scripts inside the virtual machine. So what I have here, yeah, I have here an um, installation of uh, Python software properties if you need it. And this is executed every time I boot up my Vagrant box. I actually, this gets executed. And if this is all I need, then I'm good to go. And you should really do this only if you need two or three comments. If you have more than that, it's not really a good use case. So for example, I have one virtual machine where I just have dashing, some dashboard framework running, which is just 
one one line of Ruby gem installation and then one line of some Syncling, I guess, and then that's all I, all I have. And for this, the shell script really works very well. I don't need a big fancy provisioner for this. But as soon as you get, for example, Apache and then some configuration file there and PHP and O, PHP ini, and what else uh, do I need? And then my SQL, for example, and you need to install some tables, maybe some users, so your Drupal can really work with that. That's a problem, and th you don't want to do this with Shell. There are many more advanced provisioners which you can use. For example, there's Ansible. Ansible is fairly new, at least to me. I didn't knew it exists until I um, did the talk, or I wrote the talk, and then I started playing around with it, and in two days I had my whole production environment set up with it. So it's fairly easy. It's a itself called a simple IT orchestration engine, and what it does, it you specify your whole environment with YAML files, and then on your on your host, um, Ansible SSHs into each of your of your virtual machines or real machines, and then executes all the codes or all the comments it needs to to get your your uh, environment up and running. And as I said, this is, you can do this for, for cloud providers, you can do this for your bare metal machines, you can do this for your local machine, but you can also do it for Vagrant. And with Vagrant, the one problem is that you need Ansible installed on the host machine. And the reason why I, why I don't like it is because this needs, you have another, means you have another dependency on your host. So up until now, it was like install Vagrant, install VirtualBox, Download the, the Git repository. I will show a workflow later of how you can really work with Vagrant. And then everything is set up. Now you need Ansible as well, which I don't really like. But it's there, and if it's a good use case for you, you should really look into it. Next thing is Chef. Chef is fairly well known. It's very big. It's, um, or the, the main idea here is to write cookbooks. And cookbooks are Ruby code with some kind of DSL on top where you specify how your host looks like, and then uh, your client looks like, your virtual machine looks like, and then on the virtual machine you execute Chef, and it takes care of installing everything. And as you see, I mean, you need a little time to get into it, but it's fairly easy. You can do templates, you can do um, almost everything which you can really think of. This is, this is used by, by big, I think Facebook moved to Chef um, some time ago. And I, for example, I had a 30 server environment, everything, I need, uh, didn't need to go into any of the machines with SSH, anything, everything was done through Chef. And when a new, uh, when, we buy, when we bought a new server, uh, it, it took me about 10 minutes. I needed to SSH into it once, set a password, then get back to, to Chef, tell him, set up this host and everything was done. For your Vagrant, you don't need this big of a setup. Chef can run solo, which means it just execute inside your virtual machine. You're writing these cookbooks right here. Chef has the possibility to um, differentiate between different operating systems. So you can say, if the machine is a, is a Ubuntu, do this. If it's a, I don't know, CentOS, do this. If it's a Arch, do this. But for Vagrant, at least in a, in a very simple configuration, you don't need it. You just write this and you're good to go because you have one virtual machine and that's probably it. You have Puppet, which is mostly like Chef, but then a little bit different. Main difference for you to recognize is that the uh, cookbooks or Chef uh, Puppet calls it manifests are looking a little bit different, but it does the same thing. You're specifying in some, in some uh, DSL language how your machine should look like and Puppet is running everything. The one very big difference is that Chef runs your scripts from top to bottom. It doesn't care about dependencies, at, at least, of course, if you do an apt get, apt will get the dependencies for you, but Chef in itself doesn't care about dependencies. It just runs from top to bottom. While in Puppet, Unity configure which comment relies on which comment, and which comment triggers which comment, and then Puppet really makes the, makes the sorting out of it and it depends on what you like best. Puppet, <coughs> sorry, 
Puppet is also used in many big environments, so it's really capable of doing everything. And again, for Vagrant, you really need a fairly simple, fairly simple setup. There is, uh, at least I never encountered a really, really the need to have really big manifest, really big configuration, because when you, when you work on a project or on many projects, you mostly have one, one virtual machine. So you have Ubuntu or Debian or whatever you want, whatever is up to you. And you don't need to, you don't, you need to uh, provisioning to set up this one virtual machine and not many different ones. So these tools are mostly aimed at big companies setting up tens of thousands of servers, and that's why they are so complicated on the first look. But when you actually dig a little deeper, you see that it's if you are, don't need all these special things, it's fairly easy. You have plugins. Plugins are installed uh, with a Vagrant plugin command. You have, for example, a plugin um, to uh, use Boxen as a provisioner. I never had any experience with Boxen, so I cannot tell you about it, but it seems awesome. And you have a plugin which manages your host files. You can, as I said before, have a special provider, VMware, if you have some special um, virtualization going on. You have many plugins, which, for example, one plugin, which is a comment you can take screenshots from inside your virtual machine. So if, for example, you use Vagrant in an automatic setup where you have, for example, Jenkins running as a build server, Jenkins boots up the virtual machine, executes all your code, do some tests against it, and then shuts down, and you want to know what's going on, you can do, take screenshots with this plugin and then put them somewhere and see what's going on. And this is pretty much the configuration. What I didn't put up here, but, but which is very, fairly easy if you follow the documentation, the documentation is really good at going through the whole setup with you. So you're getting, oh, okay, I need to do a Vagrant in it, I do a Vagrant up and everything. So I don't point it out here because it's really for you to experience yourself. If you look at vagrantup.com, the documentation is pretty good as far as you get started. So I didn't put this in here, but you can look it up yourself. A sample workflow, when you have Vagrant set up in your company or for yourself, for your friends, for wh whomever you code with, might look a little bit like this. You have your repository where there is the Vagrant file and everything you need for provisioning. So being a shell scripts, Ansible scripts, being a chef uh, cookbooks or puppet manifests, some special things you might need to put somewhere. And you have all this in the Git repository. You are doing uh, cloning the repository, you are making a Vagrant up, and then it takes a while, depending on your setup. My virtual machine takes about an hour, uh, if you set it up at first, because it's downloaded about two gigabytes of I don't know what, and, but you only need to do this once, so it's, it's okay. And then you can SSH into it, and then the virtual machine is running. And if all your colleagues have the same setup of, for example, you have a workspace, where you have your project folder and then this virtual machine folder. Then you can even set the Vagrant file in a way that it automatically recognizes the project folder, puts it in var www project, and you don't need to do anything yourself, which means with these three comments, you can then actually use your browser to access the tool. And if your tool is set up in the right way, and if there's some build script which actually uh, looks at all the dependencies, installs everything, does the database manipulation, then you're good to go. No need to do anything else. Of course, this means it's portable. You know, I mean, think about when you the last time changed your laptop. You did get another laptop, and then, oh my god, I need to set up everything. And now it's one, two, three, four comments, and a little bit of waiting. I mean, that's okay for me. In my book, that's a win. And it actually is that easy. We had a fairly, fairly complicated setup with Redis in there, and I will talk about it later. And it was fairly complex, but with a little bit of tweaking, our new hire could install everything, all our projects within, I don't know, 15 minutes. Then, as I said, one hour of uh, running, machine running, and then he was good to go and everything worked. And as soon as anybody has some update, you're just fetching your virtual machine folder again, 
So for example, some configuration changed. And of course, you're not making configuration changes inside your virtual machine, but you're making it inside the provisioner. So you're changing your provisioning files and then booting up again or provisioning your virtual machine again. And then it's everything is set up again as you like. You're committing this one. Your colleagues are down, uh, fetching your Git repository, provisioning their VM. They don't even need to know what you changed. You just say, hey, I changed something, which may be important, and they're fetching it, and everything is run in the background. And now I would like to take the last 15 minutes or so to talk about some things I experienced and also about the downsides. So when I'm talking about Vagrant, and I talk about Vagrant a lot because I really love it, I almost always get the question, what is about, what is about this provisioners? Which one should I use? And my advice is usually, it really doesn't matter. So you can, I mean, you shouldn't use shell scripts because shell scripts really tend to mess up and it's not, not really, really the good thing to go. But other than that, if you're using Ansible or Chef or Puppet or Boxen or I don't know what, at least it's, if it's an established tool and you know how to use it, then use it. I mean, as said uh, with some restrictions, I don't like Ansible that much because it t it's another dependency. And while, for example, Vagrant is platform independent, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on Mac uh, and on Windows. And for example, Ansible only runs on Linux and Mac. So you cannot run a Vagrant machine which relies on Ansible provisioning on a Windows machine, which is not very nice. Then again, Chef and Puppet, for example, they are only executed inside the virtual machine, so you don't need to install anything on your host at all for these to run. And regarding Chef versus Puppet, it doesn't matter much. I choose Chef because I think Chef is a little bit more programmer-centric, while Puppet is a little bit more system administration-centric, but that's just me. So look at the documentation for each 10 minutes and then decide what you like best. That's, that's all I can say because it really, it really doesn't matter much. Regarding one virtual box against many virtual boxes. So this is also a thing uh, many people are confused with. Shall I have one Vagrant machine and to put every project in there or should I have different? And I do both and I don't think any of them is really ideal or really good because both have their drawbacks. And If you, if you think about it, if your server or your production environment is only one server and you have 10 projects running on it because they are small projects, you don't have that much traffic and everything, then of course it's okay to use one machine because this really resembles your virtual env uh, your environment and if you have one database on another machine, you can also put this together because it really makes not much of a difference. If you have many servers and they really differ in the, in the setup, for example, you need different PHP versions, uh, you have different MySQL versions, you need Node.js and everything on the one, but it cannot be installed in the other and stuff like this, then maybe it's a good idea to split the virtual machines and really have one for, for each server or even one for each project. And if, of course, it depends on your whole setup. If you are working alone, it may be okay to have only one virtual machine. If you are working in a big company and you have people who are in this project but not in this, and another one is in this but in this, and everything. This would make a one, one machine setup really complicated because you always have to think, okay, for this project I need this and this and this, but not this, and especially if then you have some, some software which cannot be installed for the one project but for the other, uh, it gets messed up and it's r usually not a very good idea, so you have to split it up. But for me, I never really found a balance because then again you have much more operational costs because you need to uh, maintain every, every one of your Vagrant boxes. If there is a new, new PHP version, you need to go to every one of your Vagrant boxes. You don't only need to, to actually update it, you actually check if the, if the update is okay, so you need to boot everyone. And depending on what you're uh, what you're doing. Uh, if you're a developer, this may be too much of a task and then just one box is fine. As I said, I did both. Uh, they are not really ideal, but on the other hand, it, it's not that much of a hassle. You can go with both. And then 
I get a question, oh my god, I need to build my own box and how I do this and everything. And my advice here is use the standard Ubuntu 12.10 and run with it. Because, and why I say this is really because you don't need to build your own box. There are so many out there. If it's not Ubuntu, there is Debian out there, there is Arch out there. And then when you're, when you're using the custom box, of course, there's nothing installed. And then you use your provisioner to install everything. Because then this makes it fairly easy to change configuration. If you want to switch from Apache to Nginx, you just make sure your provisioner knows about that there should be no Apache installed but an Nginx. And the next time somebody boots up the machine, it, everything gets installed. On the other hand, if you have it installed on the base box, so you are setting up a virtual box manually, installing Apache and PHP and MySQL, and then exporting it so you can use it with Vagrant, this is hard. Because now you need to tell everybody, hey, you need to install a new box because Vagrant doesn't do it. Vagrant doesn't check if there is a new box. You have to tell Vagrant that there is a new box and that it should download it. And if somebody forgets it, then he's left with the old and suddenly you have it works on my machine again. And also, if you have, let's say, five different boxes, you can use the same, the same um, base box for it, so using the same template, let's say, and then with permissioning, just add up the stuff you need. When you have a fairly configured virtual machine as a box, that's fairly hard because now you have Apache like burned in there and you cannot just, of course you can try to deinstall and everything, uh, but it's fairly more complicated. And these are, yeah, three discussions I ran into very much. There is also one which is a disadvantage I mentioned in the beginning, Vagrant is really slow. At least, or let's say Vagrant isn't slow because Vagrant is just a CLI tool. Vagrant is just plugging in providers with your base box, with your provisioner, with plugins, with shared folders. And Vagrant isn't slow. VirtualBox is slow. But that doesn't matter because that's a problem to you. And you need to think about how you're going to solve this. Because if you are, for example, if you're on Windows, then it's really slow. Like in the beginning, you don't, mention, uh, you don't recognize it because it's with few folders, few files, it's fairly OK. But as soon as your shared folders get more content, they are really slowing down a lot. And on Linux, you have the advantage of using NFS. So you can use NFS to actually get your files in there without the shared folders of VirtualBox. And on Windows, you don't have this. So some people do Zamba, but actually this is uh, some kind of a workaround I don't like. And some people, for example, have something like like a Dropbox setup where you actually sync a folder inside your virtual box with the shared folder and if anything changes, get synced uh, back and forth and woo. This is really, really a mess. And actually you don't want to do this. And VMware can help here. VMware is much faster also in the in the whole execution of the of the virtual machine but also with the share folders. I didn't have the time to, to play with it, because it, also because it costs money, both the plugin and VMware itself. But it actually, it, I hear it's pretty good. From the people I talk with, it's uh, pretty fast. And so it's a nice alternative. And of course, you can have your, your own setup, whatever you need. And for example, if you use EC2, you have the, the whole problem of getting your code in there. Because actually, from what I get, EC, the EC2 plugin or the EC2 provider is actually just for maintaining your production or staging environment, so booting it up, SSHing into it, and not really to have it as a development environment. Then I get this. I get yet another tool. Because people say, oh, I don't want to, I have all these tools, uh, Apache, PHP, and all this other stuff I need to manage, and now I get another tool. And the thing is, this is not another tool. This is the only tool you need from now on. So you're really, what you're doing is you're, you're extracting all this, all this system administrator work from your developers in terms of their own PC into somebody who is dedicated to doing this. Maybe it's a developer or maybe it's a system administrator. And the developer, as I showed you before, doesn't need to know about the stack at all. 
And I have one example where in a my old company, we uh, all worked as well three to four projects and we all worked on this together. And in one week I decided to install Redis and for, one, for some reason I didn't talk to anybody about it. I just, uh, it was in my head and I said, oh, Redis, nice, neat. And I tied everything up and then um, I, we, we were using it in the project and then after one week somebody said, hey, uh, didn't you want to install Redis? And I, it's in there. I'm using it right now and you're using it too. And he was like, why? Huh? I didn't, didn't really get it because Vagrant, when it was provisioned again, installed Redis, made sure the configuration stick, and then the project used Redis and the developer didn't even know about it. So instead of going to everyone, hey, you need to install Redis, make sure it's on port this and that, and uh, whatnot, it was just install the virtual machine again. And that's actually it, what you want to need to do, what you need to do. And then I get lots of lots of questions other than that, or maybe mixing up with this. And this is actually mostly the end of my presentation. And the advice is just start. So I had a discussion with the Munich uh, Symphony user group Munich last week. And we were discussing about Vagrant, about my talk. And some people were like, what's going on? Do you really, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I was like, people, install Vagrant. Choose a minimal, pro minimal project, maybe some pet project you have, or maybe something you can just get started, which is not that important for your company, and use it. And look it up, and start with the minimal thing which works. So one vagrant file, or one vagrant box, simple provisioning, use shell provisioning if you like, and just get it running, and see what you can do with it, and then advance from there. Because if you don't start, you're never gonna finish, and if you think about, all these, these little questions, you actually there is no real answer because it really the um, it really relies on your setup, on your specific need. You can have one box, many boxes, whatever you like. It really doesn't matter. So thanks for staying with me. At least coming because of the chocolate in the other room. So I really I really uh, appreciate that. And if you have any questions. Now is the time, or you can actually hit me up. I'm here today, tomorrow, and talk about me, uh, talk with me about Vagrant. Yeah. No, 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 no. You can do it in the in the Vagrant file. I didn't show it because it's provider specific. So if you're using virtual machine, you, virtual machine exposes a specific configuration parameters to the uh, to Vagrant, and you can add all set it up in the, in the uh, Vagrant file. But if you're using VMware, it's a different configuration, of course, because VMware does things different. But in essence, uh, you do everything in the Vagrant file. You don't need to do anything on the host. Um, you, have, you would have to try it. I'm not really sure. What we did in our company, we didn't have the, the Vagrant file in our Git repository, but a Vagrant file.dist, and then every developer would copy it over because we had some, uh, for example, one, uh, he couldn't use the IP address we all other used because there was something messed up, and um, somebody had some different folders, folder structure, so he needed to do the, the shared folders different. So we had one Vagrant file, which was one Vagrant file dist, in the repository and everybody just could copy it, rename it, and then boot up Vagrant and maybe do some things different. This makes it a little bit different to update, but it works. Okay, so uh, you can have some defaults and every developer can set his defaults for every Vagrant file. Thanks. So you want to set up virtual hosts in the in the VM and then set up uh, actually change your host file in the in the host. There are plugins plugins for this, but um, not out of the standard because actually Vagrant only works on the on the VM and not on the host. But you there are plugins which I think do this pretty well. 
I'm not using them, I'm doing this host file manually because I really don't want Vagrant to mess up with my host, but that's, that's up to you. And you could also write a plugin if there is none. <laughs> No. I guess, but this, this is depending on Linux and Mac, is it? Yeah, and as uh, we already run on Windows, then we are really restricted to this. Yeah. No, I got used to the little um, thing, and I'm also migrating to Linux so I can use NFS. And uh, so this is not a problem anymore, but in the past it was, and it's some kind of trade-off you made. And if this is a trade-off you can live with, then it's okay. I mean, for example, if you use Symfony, then you have many caching going on, so it's actually not that slow. It's slower than it's on your host, but it's not that slow. If you have a big project and it's not caching anything, then you might have a bigger problem. The problem here is really reads and writes from disk. Everything else is almost the same, as far as I can tell. And really, the writes on disk are killing you. Yeah? Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. So the thing is, when you first up, uh, on the first update, of course, everything gets installed. And in this specific setup, we are downloading about two gigabytes of LaTeX documentation and everything or actually set up with everything, I don't know. And we need it for some special thing. And a normal Vagrant app took, take about, let's say, 20 seconds, plus the time it takes to install everything when you do it manually. So if you, for example, install Apache, of course, it downloads the Apache sources. It needs to install them, putting them, and that's the time it takes. And on the next uh, setup, it does the same thing again. But then, of course, for example, APT recognizes you already installed Apache and doesn't do anything. So there is no no um, time loss there. And also, if you're you can actually boot your Vagrant file without provisioning. So it's just booting it up. If you don't, if you know there is no changes, then you can just boot it up without provisioning, and you're good to go in the time it takes to boot your virtual machine, which is probably a minute. Okay, so this is it. Thanks again, and if you have any questions, just come talk to me. Have a great conference. <laughs> <laughs>